It is now my honor to introduce to you Dr. Carolyn K. Pan, who will speak to today about diabetic retinopathy. Dr. Carolyn Pan is a board-certified ophthalmologist and fellowship-trained vitreoretinal surgeon. She focuses on retinal vascular diseases, macular degeneration, and surgical repair of retinal detachments, macular pathology, and complications from cataract surgery. She has co-authored peer-reviewed articles on topics ranging from optical coherence tomography imaging to embryonic stem cells for macular degeneration. In addition to her clinical practice, she is dedicated to the education and training of medical students, residents, and fellows. As recognition of her efforts, she received a faculty teaching award in 2016 from the Byers Eye Institute at Stanford University. Dr. Pan is Clinical Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology at Stanford University. Her clinical practice is mainly based at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, where she serves as Chief of the Retina Service. Following Dr. Pan's presentation, there will be some time for your questions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pan to the podium. Um, I want to thank Christy and the Vista Center for inviting me to speak with you all this morning. Um, Dr. Stanis Lowe, he's one of my partners and colleagues, he's on the board of the Visit Center, and he basically came up to my office one day and said, hey, can you just give a talk to the Visit Center sometime in September on something? <laughs> and I said, okay, sure. And um, I thought about what I should talk to you guys about. I wasn't sure what sort of um, audience I would have. It would be patients, <laughs> fellow physicians, or just members in the community. And um, as Christy mentioned, my clinical practice is mainly based out of Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. It's the county hospital for Santa Clara um, County. And um, while the hospital is a freestanding hospital on its own and affiliated with Stanford, the Department of Ophthalmology, we are intimately connected. And the retina service, we're actually all Stanford doctors who go down and we take turns, you know, spending time down there, teaching the residents, seeing patients, and for myself, I mainly be down there because it's hard to juggle, you know, when you have thousands of patients and seven doctors coming through, you need to have somebody who kind of maintains continuity. And for my particular patient population, I feel the disease that I am constantly battling day in and day out is diabetes. Um, and it's probably the number one reason why patients come see me every day. Um, you know, even as a retina specialist, we treat a variety of diseases. This is the one that frustrates me the most. Um, and when we're successful, it gives me the most pleasure, but most days it gives me um, the most work. So I wanted to talk to you guys about diabetes. I really feel like this is an epidemic that is sweeping our nation. And many of you may be afflicted with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. And depending on what stage of um, disease you have, you may know a lot about it or you may know a little about it. And I feel that the education is really um, the most important aspect of this disease. So let's talk a little bit about diabetes in general. It truly is an epidemic. There are 30 million adults in the United States who are affected with diabetes, and one and a half million adults are newly diagnosed with diabetes every single year. And not to mention that we have 84 million patients in the country who are pre-diabetic. And so these are people who, you know, they may not meet criteria for treatment with diabetic medications or with insulin, but having pre-diabetes, you are still having damage to some of your end organs um, that may not be as severe as if you had full-blown diabetes, but it's still there. And in a future slide, I'll be showing um, that it's the duration of disease that really affects um, whether or not you end up having diabetic retinopathy. And so these pre-diabetics, even though they're not technically diabetic, the time that you have prediabetes, that leads into the time that you may develop diabetic retinopathy and subsequent vision loss. And in um, this chart down here in the bottom, it shows, you know, we're all susceptible. So it doesn't matter your race or ethnicity, it doesn't matter where you live in the country. We can say California, we're healthy, we're, you know, we are all about active <coughs> outdoor lifestyle, but we are equally affected. Maybe a little less in the south, but we're not, you know, immune to this disease. So here in California, it's an epidemic as well. There are 4 million Californians who have diabetes, probably more now, this is data from last year. I think this was based when our population in California was only around like 35 million, and now we're at 39 million. Um, about 1 million patients have diabetes and don't even know it. 
10.7 million in California have prediabetes, and there's 260,000 Californians who are diagnosed with diabetes every single year. So again, it really is an epidemic. You know, when we think about the past, the big diseases that wipe out large populations, we think about like the plague and tuberculosis, but diabetes is really a silent epidemic. And I think in future generations looking back, this will definitely be something that our children, they learn about, um, you know, in elementary school as something that has really affected the population. So how does diabetes affect the eye? Today, I'm a retina specialist, so we'll be focusing on diabetic retinopathy. But diabetes can also lead to cataract development. Cataract is just when the lens in the eye gets cloudy. Naturally, it happens from aging, but diabetes speeds that process. So whereas um, a healthy individual without diabetes may not require cataract surgery until the sixth or seventh decade of life, um, patients with diabetes may require cataract surgery or cataract treatment in the third or fourth decade of life. And then glaucoma is also another disease um, that diabetics are at increased risk for. Glaucoma is a disease that affects the optic nerve. That's the nerve that connects your eye to your brain and transmits the information. Um, and diabetics have a two times risk or increased form of risk to develop glaucoma. So let's focus on diabetic retinopathy. That's what I'm here to talk to you guys about this morning. So what happens? So diabetes, we know that you have high blood sugar or blood glucose level, and the sugar um, by byproducts basically coat your red blood cells and the walls of your blood vessels, and it causes damage to these blood vessels. These blood vessels, they live everywhere in your body, not just in your eyes. The eyes is a un are a unique um, part of the body where we can dilate your, your pupils and actually see the blood vessels. But elsewhere in the body, like your kidneys, the nerves, um, around your heart, these levels are still there, we just can't see it. And that's why diabetics oftentimes, they will have diabetic neuropathy, where they cannot feel um, their, the nerves, especially in the feet, and they have subsequent complications from that. Diabetics will oftentimes end up having kidney failure and end up being on dialysis, um, and also an increased heart disease, because the small vessels that are nourishing your heart, the muscles of your heart, they're not adequately developing or delivering uh, blood flow and nutrients to um, the tissue. So the leading cause of blindness in patients under age 50 is diabetic retinopathy. So over age 50 in the United States is macular degeneration. Um, the name age-related macular degeneration, it tells you it's aging. But in our young patients under 50, diabetes is the number one and preventable uh, cause of vision loss. There are about 12,000 to 24,000 new cases of blindness from diabetes each year. And you know, blindness is a very specific criteria, which we say is 2200 vision or worse. So it's, we had that cut off because that's the, the vision you need to ambulate or to walk around. But many people in this room know, just because you don't meet the criteria for blindness doesn't mean you don't have vision loss or vision impairment. And so that number is actually much greater. You know, 24,000, it's a large number, but I think the number actually is in, probably in the millions of patients who have their vision affected by diabetes. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, consistently high blood sugars or blood glucose damages the um, lining of the vessels, um, especially in the retina, and then over time these vessels are attenuated, they no longer deliver adequate blood flow, and the tissue is damaged. So there are different stages of diabetes. The most common is the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. It's an early stage. Um, this stage, oftentimes, if we can control your blood sugars, we can reverse it or minimize damage. Um, and you, you usually do not lose vision from non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy alone. You lose vision from a complication of non-proliferative non diabetic retinopathy called macular edema. This picture here just shows some findings that when we look in the eye that we see with diabetic retinopathy. So <clears throat> you see hemorrhages. This is, this is blood that basically, as these blood vessels are damaged, they are, um, the walls become leaky, and blood inside the blood vessels leaks out into the retina. We see microaneurysms, which are little outpouchings of um, blood vessels, and these blood vessels, these outpouchings also leak fluid and lead to macular edema. So this is another image that demonstrates that. It's black and white um, because this is something called a fluorescein angiogram. And basically it looks, it's a special diagnostic test that we do. 
that um, looks at the overall health of the blood vessels, and all these white dots that are lighting up like a Christmas tree, these are all the mac microaneurysms that are causing leakage of fluid into the retina. So macular edema, as I mentioned, that is a complication of diabetic retinopathy that can lead to vision loss, and that is characterized by swelling that occurs in the central part of the retina. So the macula um, is part of your retina, it's the center part, just like your nose is part of your face, and this is just like in real estate, location, location, location. The macula is the, high, the best location of your retina. This is what we use to read. This is what we use to you know, do basically everything we want to do. If we want to cook, we want to sew, we want to um, use the computer, watch TV, you're using your macula all the time. Reading the slide, we're all using our macula. And as the blood vessels are damaged, they become leaky, and fluid leaks into the macula, causing swelling. And this is probably one of the leading causes of vision loss and diabetes. About 20% of the population will have macular edema at some point. Diabetic macular ischemia. This is what, what happens when um, the blood vessels, as they're not uh, delivering good blood flow, there's non-perfusion. And the center part of the macula, the very, very center part, we call it the fovea. This is really when you have the highest concentrations of your photoreceptors, we use to see the very, very fine print if those cells no longer get adequate blood flow. And over time, this area becomes ischemic and you result in central vision loss, similar to macular degeneration. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy, this is a more advanced stage of the disease, and it is called proliferative because it's characterized by abnormal blood vessel growth, either on the surface of the retina or into the vitreous. The vitreous is the jelly that is um, inside the eye in front of your retina. And patients can lose vision because these blood vessels can bleed and cause a vitreous hemorrhage. The blood vessels also, scar tissue or um, fibroblasts, which are these like little cells, they grow along these abnormal blood vessels. And as the blood vessels regress, sometimes the fibroblast or fibrous tissue, it remains. And that forms scar tissue that connects the retina to the, to the vitreous. And that scar tissue can pull on the retina and lead to a tractional retinal detachment. So this is um, an image looking into the eye, of a right eye of a patient. This is um, their optic nerve, this whole orange area here, that's your entire, your retina. And here are some normal blood vessels, but then these fine, lacy blood vessels growing on the surface, these are all neovascularization or signs of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And you can see the red here that is bleeding onto the retinal surface. Here's another example. This is the fluorescein angiogram. These abnormal blood vessels, they leak a lot of um, fluid. Here, this shows these black areas. This shows lack of blood flow to the rest of the retina, which is also characteristic of uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And here's another image. Here's these abnormal blood vessels that are growing on the surface of the retina. And here, all this red here, that is vitreous hemorrhage, basically blocking um, the retina and causing vision loss. Tractional retinal attachment, as I mentioned before, that is characterized by scar tissue that grows along these abnormal blood vessels and then can kind of contract and pull on the retina. So here's a diagram showing that the scar tissue is pulling on the retina. The retina should be lining the inside of the eye, and here it is pulled off the surface of the eye. And if it's pulled off in the center part, in the macula, then you can lose vision. So examination and testing. Um, diabetics, it's recommended that they get a thorough eye exam. Um, so what we do in, in the clinics, we measure your vision, we measure your intraocular pressure because we know that you have an increased risk of glaucoma with diabetes. We evaluate the front of the eye for a cataract, we look at the lens, grade how severe the cataract is. And then we dilate the pupils and we look into, into the eye looking at the retina using both a slit lamp or an indirect um, ophthalmoscope. So this is the slit lamp here and that's an indirect ophthalmoscope. Some places um, we employ non-videotech photography screening. So um, especially when you, know, you have a large diabetic population and you only have a few number of ophthalmologists or optometrists who can perform a thorough eye exam. Screening, these, photo, these cameras are excellent resources for screening and they can take pictures of your retina without um, dilating your pupil. It's something that you can kind of just do in a regular doctor's office. And um, so here at, at Santa Clara County and also um, at Stanford too, we're employing these cameras 
and endocrine clinics and primary care doctors clinics to try and catch as many patients who may not know they have disease as possible. And then if there's a disease that's noted on these photos, we then refer in for um, a thorough examination. So when we look inside, what are we looking for? We're looking for those microaneurysms, we're looking for those hemorrhages. And then based on what we see, we gauge the severity, and that lets us know how closely we need to monitor um, our patients, how frequently we need to repeat the exam, if we need to contact the primary care doctor and endocrinologist and um, make sure that they are really working with the patients even more so on in controlling diabetes. We can counsel patients that, you know, you're on your insulin, you're on your metformin, but you really need to quit smoking, you really need to watch your diet and uh, exercise more because you're at very high risk for vision loss. And as I mentioned before, you know, a thorough eye exam is necessary for all diabetics. In type 1 um, diabetics, we recommend that it's three to five years after initial diagnosis, and then you have that your eye is examined every single year after that. So type 1 diabetes oftentimes affects young children. And so if you're, when you're eight years old, you're diagnosed, by the time you're in middle school, you should be seeing an eye doctor every single year to be detecting any early diabetic retinopathy changes. Type 2 diabetes, which is really the epidemic that's sweeping the nation, is um, tr and traditionally thought to be as adult onset, but the age of onset actually is getting younger and younger um, every year. And so type 2 diabetes, we recommend actually examining at the time of diagnosis because as I mentioned, by the time you are diagnosed with type, type 2 diabetes, you may have had pre-diabetes for many years and in that period, damage can be occurring to the retina and the blood vessels inside your retina. Um, and then pregnancy is also known to accelerate the changes. So even if your diabetes was well controlled um, prior to getting pregnant, once you're pregnant, in those nine months, we oftentimes will see an acceleration of damage in the eyes. And so all um, diabetics who are thinking about getting pregnant, we recommend having strict glucose control prior to conceiving and then having an ophthalmologist monitor you closely throughout your pregnancy. Um, other things that we do to um, <coughs> examine you in the clinic is we perform some ocular imaging. Um, ocular coherence tomography, or OCT for short, this is very um, common and now widely popular imaging technique that um, has probably been around for a little bit over a decade. And it's helpful for us in diabetic retinopathy to assess the degree of macular edema. Uh, fluorescing angiography, that was some of the images I showed you before, the black and white ones. This is a dye that we inject through an IV and we take a series of pictures with a filter. And this lets us evaluate the extent of the vascular changes in the retina. So the OCT, this top image here, this is um, histology. So this is from like a cadaver retina where we um, took a slice and we laid the retina on its side. And these are all the different layers of the retina, kind of labeled here. And then this is the OCT. So this is, you know, in a cadaver, you're taking the eyeball out and looking at it under a microscope. This is in vivo, so in a live human being with this OCT image. And you can see these different bands, they kind of, they line up with the different layers of the retina. So it's almost, People sometimes say it is like a living biopsy. Instead of having to take a piece of tissue and looking at the microscope like you do for pathology, for tumors or you know cancers, this is something that we can look directly, like a biopsy of your retina in real time. Um, so when we see the OCT, this is the cross-sectional, but it also gives us like a topographic map of um, your macula. And just like a topographic map in the United States, where the Great Plains are green and the Rocky Mountains and Appalachian Mountains are red, um, this is a topographic map of your macula, and red means swelling or thickening, and white is extreme thickening or swelling. And this lets us um, observe changes in retinal thickness, changes in the retinal layers on this cross-section, and lets us monitor progression as well as um, response to treatment. So fluorescing angiography, this is um, another diagnostic test that we use to look at the health of the actual retinal vascul uh, vasculature. So what happens is a nurse puts an IV in, injects a dye through the IV, and then the photographer, through a special camera with special uh, filters, takes a series of pictures as the dye is flowing through your blood vessels. So this is early at 16 seconds. You can see the arteries are being filled, but the veins that return blood have not yet um, been filled with the dye. And then at 20 seconds, just four seconds later, now the arteries, the blood coming out, and the veins, the blood going back in, you can see the dye lighting up. That's why it's, um, the vessels are kind of like grayish here. And then at 41 seconds, there's dye in all the blood vessels. 
And this lets us look for leaky blood vessels, it looks, lets us look for abnormal perfusion or lack of perfusion, and um, also diagnose the macular schema that I mentioned earlier. So treatment options, prevention, prevention, prevention. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, you know, diabetes is, once you have retinopathy, there are certain things that we can treat to reverse the vision loss, but this is a preventable cause of vision loss. And I think education for the general population is just not adequate, um, and patients don't realize how devastating the disease can be. Excellent glucose control. So I tell all my diabetics that come into clinic, you know, your birthday, everyone knows off the top of their head. Your social security number, you all know. Your children's birthdays, you all know. But the number of the diabetic that you should know is your A1C level. So when your doctor asks you, how your diabetes is doing, it doesn't really matter what your blood sugar was that morning or that night, the night before or two weeks ago. The A1C level lets us know what your blood sugars are doing for a three month interval. And every diabetic, you know, should be getting this checked at least once a year. Many primary care doctors will check it twice a year or multiple times a year, depending on the severity of the disease. And also blood pressure control. Blood pressure affects the blood vessels in the body. Um, traditional um, criteria for high blood pressure is a systolic of 140 or greater and a diastolic of 90 or greater. And we want our patients who have diabetes to be even better than that. We want them to be 130 or less or over 80 or less. So um, there are many, many you know, trials looking at how to prevent diabetic retinopathy or what factors influence diabetic retinopathy. So this is one of like the old, original trials way back in the 80s. It's called the Diabetic Control Complications Trial. And we still teach our residents this to this day because the information we gleaned from this trial is really valuable. It was looking at type 1 diabetics and it basically showed that with very good glycemic or glucose control, you can reduce the risk of newly diagnosed retinopathy by 75%. There's a reduced progression of existing retinopathy in 50% of the patients. Reduced progression um, at all levels. So not just, you know, if you're mild, you can reverse to having no retinopathy, but if you're mild, progressive severe, progression to proliferative diabetic retinopathy, developing macular edema, or requiring treatment. Um, there was some um, adverse effect at 6 and 12 months, so like earlier in the study, and that basically showed that if you control your diabetes too rapidly, if you are, um, your blood sugars are constantly running in the 400s and your A1C is 16, and you all of a sudden within two months control it and your A1C drops to seven, you can have a slight worsening of the diabetic retinopathy changes, but then it will kind of balance out long term. So at, if you have a patient who is, you know, all of a sudden taking really good care of themselves, it is um, prudent to you know, monitor them a little bit closely, uh, closer in ophthalmology as opposed to just following the standard guidelines of every three months or every six months or every nine months depending on their severity of disease. So similarly for type 2 diabetes, the, um, there was this large study in Wisconsin um, looking back at all patients and basically this shows that also strict control of blood sugars reduces the risk of developing and progression of diabetic retinopathy and also confirmed that it's really a duration um, how long you've had it, you have an increased risk of diabetic retinopathy. So this is any retinopathy, whether you're on insulin or not, and then this is the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So both of these have like a positive slope up. Um, percentage of uh, pat patients with proliferative di diabetic retinopathy in each of these three groups. So this is patients who um, develop the you know, sight-threatening uh, complications. And so if you're older and you, when you're diagnosed with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and you're not placed on insulin, so that's like less severe disease, you have a less likely chance of developing proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But if you're younger, which is the case these days, we have patients who are in their 20s and 30s who you traditionally would have thought they had type 1 diabetes, where they actually have type 2 diabetes, um, they have a very high risk of developing proliferative diabetic retinopathy as time goes on. Um, and then the older patients who have more severe disease at onset who require insulin treatment, obviously they also have an increased risk of developing proliferative diabetic retinopathy changes. So treatment for diabetic uh, macular edema, um, way back, maybe over a decade ago, the only treatment available was focal laser. So we use laser to close those little leaky blood vessels um, to uh, stimulate the cells and the layers of the retina to absorb the fluid that's there. 
there was a study called the ETDRS study back in the 80s, and it showed that there was a really high recurrence rate. I think I probably have a slide coming up on that. Um, and that vision didn't really improve. So we were so fortunate in the last decade, um, there's been um, kind of a shift in treatment to intravitreal injections, and there are several <coughs> intravitreal injections on the market currently, um, and there are several in the pipeline that are coming down the, um, down the way here. So the ECGRS, this was the one that looked at laser treatment. So it said 35% of patients in laser-treated group continue to have diabetic hemodynamia after one year. So it's not really great when you're telling patients, I wanted to have a laser in you to help treat your vision, but you have a 35% chance that we're going to have to do this again a year later. 40% um, of patients required retreatment within one year. Only 3% had improvement in vision. Um, three lines are better, so that's going from like 2070 to 2040 or 2040 to 2020. Um, and then only 17% had any improvement that was sustained after five years. So it was a treatment as opposed to having no treatment, but it wasn't the treatment. So like I said, in the last decade, we've been fortunate to have these intravitreal injections. Um, and this here's a diagram showing, you know, this is a needle. Patients always ask me when I'm giving them the first injection, is the needle going in my eye? And the answer is yes, it is going in your eye. Um, and patients here in the audience who have diabetic regular or macular degeneration are all too familiar with this treatment. So why did we start you doing this? So they showed that um, VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, you have increased levels of this hormone in your eyes when you have diabetic, diabetic retinopathy, and especially if you have diabetic macular edema. And so they said, well, why don't we target that hormone and see if that will help kind of slow down or reverse the disease. And so there's lots of clinical trials looking at this, but the one looking at um, Lucentis or Renabizumab, they basically split the patients into three different groups. One was like a sham injection. Don't worry, they didn't actually stick a needle. They just took a syringe and like put it on the eye. Um, these patients actually got the medication, but at different dosages. And then they followed them at two years and at um, three years um, to look at whether or not there was vision improvement, um, how many injections they needed. And so here, looking at ride and rise, both of these trials. Um, the orange and the yellow line up top here, these are the patients who received the Renabiz member of the injections. And then the white line here, this is patients who received the sham injections so of no medication. And you can see this y-axis here, this is looking at how many letters they gained on the eye chart. Um, and so after one injection, there was improvement, two injections, three injections, and there was a sustained improvement usually around you know, three to six injections here. And this is looking at them every single month and measuring their visual acuity. Um, a new drug in the last I mean, five years that came out is called ILEA or a flibercept, and this is another um, clinical trial looking at that drug, and it showed similar results. So this is a flibercept, either um, injecting it um, every month and then every two months. Those are the blue and the yellow lines, and then this is versus laser, so no injection, but just getting that focal laser, and there's sustained improvement in the vision in these patients. They're also looking um, looked at steroids. So steroid, before we had these anti-VEGF injections, we only had steroids. And steroids were great, but there are some side effects associated with steroid injections, um, such as accelerated cataract development, as well as increased risk of glaucoma. So this study looked at steroid injection in patients who've already had cataract surgery so that the vision can't be um, confounded by cataract development. And it showed that the the steroid is this yellow line, and then the orange and the blue line, these are the, um, the uh, ranapizumab or Lucentis injections. You can see that it's pretty much the same as having an intravitreal injection of the anti-budget agent compared to just a sham injection and laser alone. <coughs> so proliferative di diabetic retinopathy, um, we traditionally we treat with laser, we call it PRP, pan retinal photocoagulation, and these are small burns in the retina to reduce the oxygen demand. Um, but there's a downside, so it causes damage to your peripheral vision, dam it decreases your night vision, and decreases your contrast sensitivity. So the theory behind this is that you have you know, sick retina that's not getting good blood flow, and it is 
emitting this vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, that's recruiting your body to form these abnormal blood vessels that then can bleed, causing vitreous hemorrhage, or then can form scar tissue that leads to traction hormone attachment. And with this particular treatment, we're basically sacrificing your already sick peripheral retina, that's responsible for peripheral vision, to try and maintain your central vision. So there's no free lunch with any um, treatments. So there's always, you know, a downside. And this is probably the hardest um, treatment when I'm trying to consent my patients um, to have this treatment because, you know, all they hear is you're going to basically fry my retina, you're going to damage my peripheral vision. And really, unfortunately, it is kind of the only treatment we have to control this disease when it gets to this advanced stage. Um, and this is actually when, you know, even though I can maintain central vision, oftentimes I will refer my patients to the business center for help because they, with decreased night vision, that means you have trouble walking when there's dim lighting, um, driving at nighttime, you're affected, reading, you know, reading a newspaper with contrast sensitivity. These are all real life things, while even though their central visual acuity may be excellent um, and they don't meet criteria for legal blindness or low vision, there's definitely visual impairment that is a result of my direct <coughs> treatment. Um, we can also treat with the anti budget agents. Um, you know, the anti-vegetative agents, they work well, there have been studies kind of studying the injections with laser head-to-head -head and show that the injections are as good as the laser and they don't have the same side effects as the decreased peripheral vision, decreased night vision, decreased contrast sensitivity. However, the anti-vegetative injections, they're only, their half-life is only about 7 to 10 days and so they wear off after a month. So that's looking at patients getting monthly intravitreal injections for two years compared to patients who get the laser once and then not have to have any more treatment. And so, you know, there's no perfect solution or perfect treatment right now. And so oftentimes for patients, the burden of having to come in every single month for these injections is far greater than the vision loss they would endure with the, um, the laser. And this is definitely something, you know, I discuss with my patients when we're at this level of treatment. And then finally, if you have a traction on attachment or you have vitreous hemorrhage that's not clearing, then we have to go into surgery with a vitrectomy. So I think the most frustrating thing about my day-to-day -day life is, you know, I counsel my patients on taking care of their diabetes. I do the injections for the macrodema, we see improvement. We do the surgery to get rid of the blood, to reattach the retina. But these are all the things that I can offer as a physician um, are treatments to improve the anatomy of the eye. So I can take a picture and I can show them that their macrodema is better. I can remove the blood and I can look and I can give myself a high five that I cleared the blood. But the patient still is living with vision loss because either they had to have laser during the surgery to prevent further abnormal blood vessel growth and now they're very frustrated because um, he's a, you're a truck driver and you need to drive through the night and you can't drive at night now. Or you know you have macroedema where you improve vision but you know you really enjoy crocheting and now your central vision even though it's improved it's not good enough to see the fine work that you want to do. And that's when a resource like the Vista Center and low vision evaluation is really invaluable. Um, there's you know low vision aids that you guys will see and they'll talk about here today. Um, but mobility training. So even though your central vision is maintained, oftentimes if you don't have good peripheral vision, you know we rely on that to walk down curbs. We rely on that to cross the street. Um, assistance with your daily living skills and also with, your, with things that give you pleasure. Um, if you're you love to do needlepoint and you can't do it, then some people will say, then that's not a really a fulfilling life. Um, and counseling support groups. So these are all things that can really help with the function. And so that's why whenever I counsel patients, I always say, you know, we judge success in two ways. One is anatomic success and one is functional success. I can control the anatomic success. I can do surgery, I can do laser, I can do injections. I can work with your primary care doctor and you to maintain um, your blood sugars and you know improve all of that. But functional success, oftentimes, we, we have no control over. Without an anatomic success, it's unlikely to gain functional success, but function is really dependent on how badly the tissue was damaged, how long the disease has been there, what part of the tissue is damaged. Um, and that's the really frustrating thing about my job. Um, so in summary, vision loss and diabetes, um, cataract, which is um, reversible, fortunately, and there's actually the one thing that we have in ophthalmology that we can cure is cataracts. Glaucoma, there's a two-fold increased risk of developing glaucoma with diabetes. 
and then diabetic macular edema, diabetic macular ischemia, proliferative diabetic myopathy with the complications of vitreous hemorrhage, traction oil attachment, and then the consequence of the treatments uh, with PRP laser. Treatments, the most important one is diabetic control. Um, and so earlier you know you have diabetes and earlier your sugar is under control, then hopefully you'll never really need me as a doctor, as a, um, aside from just screening once a year. Cataract surgery, as I said, that is the one um, cure that we have in ophthalmology. We can cure patients with cataracts with surgery. Uh, there's no cure for glaucoma, just treatment, whether it's medical with eye drops or surgical management. And then for diabetic retinopathy, currently um, the only options we have right now are interventional injections, focal laser, PRP laser, uh, pars clamatrectomy, and then low vision services. So thank you everyone for your attention and your time this morning. Um,
That's the most frustrating conversation for me personally, is to explain that, well, I've quieted the disease in your eye, but the extent of damage has already occurred, this is now your new baseline level of vision. Um, and so I, that's why I think you know, education is really the most powerful treatment and resource we have for diabetes, and it truly is an epidemic. It's not just vision loss, but it's all other um, end organ damage from this really terrible disease. day-to-day -day vision, 
most patients will not notice um, a blind spot or a loss of vision due to this particular laser. Okay, my second question is, what is a pre-diabetic? So a pre-diabetic is, depending on how you're diagnosed with it, um, but oftentimes in adults, if you're going to see your primary care doctor for your yearly um, physical, they will do some blood work, and the A1C level is something that they will um, draw on many patients. And so the technical like diagnosis of uh, diabetes is your A1C is six or greater. Um, but between six and seven, they sometimes will not start you on medication, so they will use a pre-diabetic. And so that's one way. But another way is oftentimes you'll just go for regular fasting blood work, um, where they draw up you know, the electrolytes in your body, and one of those electrolytes is your fasting glucose level. So if your fasting glucose level is over 100, then you're labeled as a pre-diabetic. So that shows that you're having some issues keeping your sugars under control, but it's not bad enough to yet require treatment. So it depends, it's really the lab work that tells your doctor whether or not you're a pre-diabetic or not. Um, and then the, de the degree of your blood glucose or your A1C level, whether or not you um, need to be on medication. I'm hypoglycemic, and I need a diet very similar to a diabetic. I have five meals a day to keep my sugars level because I get shakes and get kind of weird and I, I don't do that. I understand that hypoglycemia can be a precursor to diabetes, is that true? That is true, yes, because um, your insulin, your, liver, your pancreas and your liver, they work together to control the blood glucose level, so we don't want your sugars to be too high or too low. And if you are always running low, then that tells us that the equilibrium between those two organs, something is disrupted. Um, whether it's a pancreas issue or a liver issue, but your body is not responding to insulin and glucagon, which are the hormones that control our blood sugars, um, the way a healthy person would. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a, a follow-up to that on the pre uh, diabetes. Uh, is there anything you can do to avoid becoming a pre-diabetic? So it's really lifestyle modifications. Um, you know, these days, everybody is, there's like 5,000 diets out there, and depending on where you live and what day of the week it is, there's a new fad. Um, and so it's really, um, you know, decreasing processed foods, making sure having um, a rich diet in um, leafy vegetables, you know, and then, you know, decreasing like the simple sugars and simple carbohydrates. Um, I think, Part of the reason why this our epidemic is there is, you know, we are all leaning towards like fast food. You know, back in the '80s, that was kind of the norm. Um, packaged food, readily processed food. It was all about convenience, um, and it's really kind of going back to simple grains. Um, you know, the appropriate amount of protein and you know appropriate amount of vegetables. I'm sorry. Back, back to our true nature. Exactly, um, and then also smoking is a huge risk factor for diabetes. Um, as well as high blood pressure and damage to blood vessels. Um, so it's really just healthy lifestyle. Smoking? Yeah. Are they doing any gene therapy? So they're doing gene therapy for diabetes. Like, you know, and so I am not an endocrinologist. I can't speak okay, to the specifics, but not for um, diabetic retinopathy. We're doing gene therapy in the eye for hereditary, like congenital uh, retinal, retinal degenerations. Right, so the, uh, the big one that came out in the last two years is Luxterna. It's gene therapy for patients with um, Leber's congenital amaurosis, which is a congenital disease that affects uh, kids. You're born with it and you have vision loss pretty young. Um, but nothing right now that is available mainstream for macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. How about RP? Um, so RP is thought to be a spectrum, so they're doing lots of research um, on specific <coughs> genotypes of RP, but <coughs> RP, like a clinical diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa, does not always, is not the same in every single patient. There are so many genes that are responsible. It's just like macular degeneration. You know, you have that blanket diagnosis, but you can have multiple gene mutations 
causing it. So they are looking at gene therapy for specific genotypes of RP in macular de degeneration. Um, but nothing that you can say, like, if you have it, then you just do this, this treatment and it's a one-size-fits-all. But there is treatment for that, and as well as stem cell treatment for that as well. Hi, so this is Leonor, and I'm, she's Spanish-speaking, so I'm going to ask her a question. Uh -huh. Um, she has diabetes and um, she's lost a big, a lot of her vision. So her question is that she still experiences a lot of um, discomfort in her eyes. Uh, light affects her a lot, the brightness, and her eyes always um, hurt. And she's wondering if there's any treatment for that type of thing. Um, that's a hard question to answer without examining her and knowing exactly the causes of her symptoms. Because, so, you know, I mentioned in my talk that diabetes, we focus on diabetic retinopathy. Um, but depending on the severity of your diabetic disease, you can have a whole bunch of other complications that I did not touch on. Um, so there's the traditional glaucoma we talked about, which you can treat with meds and um, management, but there's also neovascular glaucoma, which is a complication of proliferative diabetic retinopathy with those animal blood vessels. They grow into the front of the eye and they clog the drainage system, cause high pressure, and that can cause damage to the front of the eye as well. And so I would suggest just making sure that she's seeing somebody um, who's an eye care specialist and getting a thorough eye exam to really figure out the um, etiology of her symptoms. Oh, hi. Um, so someone who has pre-diabetes or is, has diabetes, uh, you know, they, the doctors recommend you know, to have a healthy diet to control. Now when I go to the stores, I see many different products, they're organic, genetically modified, or they just, you know, they, they grow in different, different ways. Have, has studies been done to, to see if it's taken, something, is something organic that, you know, is grown based on the genetically modified affects the, or improves or or it has a great effect on diabetes or not? So I'm not a nutritionist, so I, <laughs> I um, don't want to say like the wrong thing, but as far as I'm aware, there has not been any head-to-head -head comparison showing that organic is better than non-organic. Um, so, but don't quote me on that. So um, well, I understand there's um, some medication to stop uh, or slow down wet macular degeneration? Is there anything for dry at this time? No, so dry macular degeneration, the only thing that has been shown to decrease or slow down the progression are the AREDS vitamins, the AREDS 2. But those have only been shown to slow progression in patients who have intermediate disease or greater. So if you do not have macular degeneration, but you're just over 50, we don't recommend taking the vitamins. Or if you have just like uh, a few drusen or a few changes on exam when you're considered early dry AMD, the vitamins have also not been proven to slow progression. Um, so that's something that you really, if you have macular degeneration, you should be under the care of a specialist who's seeing you at least once a year, six or twice a year, depending on what severity you are, and um, adhering to the recommendations for that. What is RP? Uh, retinitis pigmentosa. It's a type of retinal degeneration. Good morning. Um, can you talk a little bit about the studies on marijuana and eye, uh, eye diseases? So, sure. So the um, main indication that I think um, is commercially distributed out there for marijuana is intraocular pressure reduction. Um, so the studies looking at that, they basically they measured the patient's intraocular pressure while they were smoking marijuana and showed that the intraocular pressure decreases while you're on marijuana, um, but it did not show a sustained effect. So if you're smoking at 1 o'clock and your intraocular pressure goes from 16 to 14, at 2 o'clock when you're not smoking, it goes back up. So there's normal kind of variation. And so um, that's a question that a lot of like glaucoma patients will ask because they it's very cumbersome to be applying and instilling those glaucoma drops on the schedule you're supposed to be on. Um, but the answer is, you know, unless you're smoking marijuana all the time, um, you're not going to have a sustained effect on intraocular pressure. Um, as far as marijuana for like diabetic retinopathy, like my, you know, what I see, um, there's no real study looking at that that's been proven for it to be effective. 
uh, mostly because even though it's marijuana and not a nicotine product, smoking has free radicals and all that bad stuff, and it's inherently um, known that the smoking byproducts is bad for your vasculature. Um, and so it would be unethical to be studying patients with diabetes and making them smoke marijuana, and then another arm not making them smoke marijuana, because you could you would be damaging their, their vasculature throughout their body. Oh. So that is also, so the um, oral version, I don't know of any, like, any clinical trial. I don't think there actually can be like clinical trials for that, um, that are um, FDA approved. Um, but there may be some private clinical trials out there that are privately funded, that's like, not under NIH funding that may be going on, but I'm not familiar with that. I just want to let everyone know we have about 10 more minutes for questions, so please raise your hand if you have one and I'll come around to you. I'm Marion. I am macular degeneration. I'm cheating to take advantage of this question uh, and answer thing. I need a ride home. <laughs> no, I, I live in South San Jose near 101 at 85. If there's anybody that lives anywhere near there, could you uh, approach me? My vision's not that great. I'm dressed in blue from head to toe. Black shoes, because I don't want my friend to come all the way back again to take me home. We'll give you a Thank right. you. There's somebody back there. Yes, could you please tell us the difference between the wet and the dry immaculate degeneration? Absolutely. So. Um, macular degeneration, part of the name is age-related, so we know age is the number one risk factor. Um, and dry macular degeneration is when we see signs of just a normal kind of wear and tear um, due to aging. And that's usually a clinical diagnosis early on that we as a physician, we examine, we see it. Patients oftentimes are asymptomatic and don't realize they have early dry macular degeneration. And the progression of the disease really is just like a function of time, um, and there are, you know, obviously risk factors that put you at increased risk for having accelerated degeneration. Um, patients with dry macular degeneration usually do not lose vision until they progress to the advanced stages, where they have loss of some of the healthy layers and tissues in the macula, in which the case they'll have like areas where the vision kind of cuts out or little scotomas or blind spots. Um, and like I said in the earlier question, there's really no treatment um, directed to reversing um, the vision loss from dry AMD or um, to slow down the progression besides just vitamin supplementation. Now, wet macular degeneration, that is characterized by abnormal blood vessels that grow in through these cracks or um, areas where there's lack of healthy tissue, kind of like a weed growing through a sidewalk. And patients lose vision, lose vision because these abnormal blood vessels, they bleed. And the blood and the fluid that they leak, that causes you to have like a blind spot. And oftentimes, it's something that happens suddenly, and patients will notice they have acute change in their vision. Or they may notice that even if they don't lose their central vision, they may have like a distortion that's like close to the center of their vision. The treatment aimed at wet macular degeneration is to get those blood vessels to go away, to regress, and the treatment for that is with intravitreal injections, the same medicine that we use for diabetes, um, because it's the same like VEGF, that hormone that's causing the growth of these abnormal blood vessels. Um, dry AMD is a precursor or risk factor for developing wet AMD, but not everybody who has wet AMD knew that they had dry AMD because he may not have been getting an eye exam every year and been diagnosed with it. And so with wet AMD, oftentimes patients, they present acutely when they have a hemorrhage. And if we can treat it within the first few days, we can oftentimes um, reverse majority of the um, damage or the vision loss, but we may not be able to reverse all of it. So the studies looking at the intravitreal injections, they compared it to the traditional laser that we talked about earlier, showed that um, the injections when given on a regular basis to keep the blood vessels from coming back and begin to regress, 95% um, of patients, they actually um, were able to like maintain their vision if they were regularly being seen and getting the treatment and at one year, and then it went to 90% at two years. 
Um, and like between 30 and 40 percent of patients improved their vision by three lines or more on the eye chart um, if they were getting treatment. So the whenever you know I'm counseling patients, you know it's always like good news, bad news. Good news, you have dry AMD. Bad news, we don't have a treatment, and unlikely, but unlikely you're going to lose vision quickly, but it'll be a slow deterioration. Whereas with wet AMD, it's good news or bad news. You have wet AMD, you lost vision. Good news, we have a treatment but you have to come back and see me every single month or almost every single month for an injection in the eye. So, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Are there any further questions? I was just wondering whether or not this presentation is gonna be available after, or? Um, I don't know, I can definitely send it to Christine. We're recording it. Oh, okay. We're recording it now, and so it'll be available on our website. Thank you for this very helpful presentation. You mentioned glaucoma as one of the results of the diabetic uh, retinopathy. Is there, are there situations where the diabetes treatment and the glaucoma treatment continue together or separately? So, um, yes, depend, so glaucoma is, I can, you know, talk, I think, for like a week on glaucoma because it's such a broad topic. Um, there are different types of glaucoma. Um, the most common part, uh, type of glaucoma is the age-related <coughs> open-angle glaucoma, and in that case, we treat with eye drops. But the kind of glaucoma that is usually associated with diabetic retinopathy, when I mentioned um, for another question, was when you have abnormal blood vessels that are growing, um, into the angle and clogging it, which then causes the pressure to rise in the eye. And so the treatment for that oftentimes will be eye drops to acutely control the pressure at the time the patient presents, but also long-term directed at the underlying problem, which is the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So ultimately treating with the injections like we do for proliferative diabetic retinopathy as well as the laser. Um, so that's when you have like concurrent treatment using glaucoma medication as well as retina care to control the, the two diseases. Hi. Hi. I have retina damage from Plaquenil. Do you do any treatment for that? So unfortunately, yes, Plaquenil toxicity is um, an area where, you know, there's lots of uh, publications or knowledge on early detection, but there isn't really any treatment for it. It is sort of like a form of macular degeneration. Um, and then even if you detect it early and you stop the plaquenil, the toxicity can progress. Um, and so for that particular disease, it's really the early detection, but once you have it, we don't really have much available besides low vision referrals in the business center to help with mobility and low vision aids. We have time for one more question. One more over there. Uh, right here. This gentleman in the white cap. Yeah. Yes, uh, my mother uh, had diabetes, mm -hmm. severe diabetes, and she, uh, she went uh, totally blind when her blood vessels burst. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never did get an explanation of what happened there. So yeah, so that would, is an example of a vitreous hemorrhage due to proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Um, so um, the existing blood vessels are not delivering adequate flow or blood flow, and the body then grows these abnormal blood vessels that grow on the surface of the retina into the vitreous. And these blood vessels are very fragile. They bleed and they house a very large hemorrhage in front of the retina. Um, then they block your vision. Um, back in the day, there really wasn't any treatment besides just waiting for the blood to clear. And then once the blood cleared, trying to get laser in to prevent further blood vessel growth. Um, nowadays, when we see um, you know, bleeding like that, we treat with the injections to get the blood vessels to stop bleeding while the body absorbs the blood that's there. But if there is too much blood that cannot be absorbed by the body alone, then we have to go in with surgery to clear it out. Um, and oftentimes we will wait like a month or two because depending on the severity of the bleed, 
the blood, the body is pretty remarkable. It can clear a lot of the blood. Um, but after a month or two, it's not clearing, then we want to go in there and clear it out because there's constant growth of these abnormal blood vessels. And as I mentioned in my talk, um, you can form the scar tissue that grows along the blood vessels that can then pull on the retina. So we really want to clear that blood out and get the disease under control so that you don't kind of progress while we're waiting for the blood to clear. But back in the day, you would just tell the patient to sit up and wait, and then you would just monitor and then put laser in if and when the blood cleared. Are they doing more research on RP? Is there more to researching that? There are a, a lot of research um, for RP. Um, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you can see like all the clinical trials that are um, being performed right now for RP. Um, and then that's just clinical trials, like what's being done in patients. There's tons of bench work or like lab research that's being done on a basic science level. But as I mentioned, you know, retinal, retinitis pigmentosa is one name that we use um, clinically, but it actually encompasses like a very large spectrum of diseases and they're all very gene specific. And so uh, depending on which genotype you have, um, you may or may not, the treatment may, may not be available and the research may not apply to your particular disease. All right, thank you so much.